stand up because I... You have to stand up. Uh, yeah. I want to apologize for last week. Um, um, I, I am sorry because uh, early in my career, and yeah, I think everybody knows I was Air Force and I was a colonel, but what you don't know is that I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And the uh, fact that we even did my doctoral dissertation on, on the new military after the fall of communism. And um, I've met Putin, I've met Gorbachev. Well, that's interesting. And I also worked for a Secretary of Defense that did, uh, we did negotiations with Israel. And I spent a lot of time in Israel. We did the Persian II when the Scuds were going into Israel uh, from Saddam. We brought over Persian II missile, and so we had to negotiate that. So I, I spent a lot of time in what they call the interagency process, mm -hmm. which is where all the uh, different facets of government get together and they write the policy. So, look, you, you just have to take, uh, I'm apologizing, and I, I was just going to tell you that I'm sorry for oh, my outburst. Here's what I love, here's what I love. Revelation still stirs us up, and it brings about these type of conversations. And that, to me, is amazing. It's amazing to me that 2,000 years later, this apocalyptic book still moves us in different directions. It moves me in different directions. I mean, that's why I do it. Like I said, very few ministers mess with Revelation. They really don't. Because they're afraid of it. But <laughs> maybe because of that very thing, Jim, they're afraid of it. But actually, if that, or they don't know what to do with it. But, but I think it does work better in the classroom than in the pulpit, okay? Although, you know, so many of so much of our liturgy is grounded in revelation. That's what you learn. I mean, we're going to see that today because it is highly liturgical. You're about to see that as we move into chapter. It's highly liturgical. Well, in the way you tie in all the books from the Old Testament, yeah, yeah, it shows us that this this language was not exactly. This was yeah, this, yeah. This was pulled. From this was pulled from somewhere. So I introduced last week. What I want to do now is uh, let's get going with the uh, with the text. And I'm going to start with uh, four one through five fourteen. We're going to start with four. Today we're going to work on four one through eleven. But what I need to do first is to talk about some themes that we're going to see. Because if you don't understand the themes that we're about to, to look at, you can't really understand um, what's going on. These themes are found not only in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Scripture, but they're also found in uh, the rabbinical writings. You'll see the same thing. Uh, Jewish mysticism. You'll see the same thing. Other uh, New Testament, not New Testament, other Christian apocalyptic. Of course, you know, Revelation was the only one that was in the canon. But other. So, so these themes are common. Okay, these are common themes. Here comes a couple more folks. But the. Uh, uh, but these are common things, and I want to I want to talk about them before we get to the the text itself, and then we'll get into the text itself. So uh, the disclosure. If you look at your outline, if you have your outline, it just starts with the disclosure of God's plan of reconciliation. We talked about that it goes all the way through. Um, and four one through nineteen ten, as I mentioned last week, focuses on the on the terrible tribulation that will occur before. And now we're going to focus on the adoration in the court of heaven starting with 4, 1 through 11, and then moving through 5, chapter 5, 14. Um, and as I mentioned last week, John's vision now switches from earth to heaven. And here are some of the things that we, we, we will see. This is just kind of our introduction. Uh, and I, I, I mentioned this, did I show this to you last week? I can't remember. Anyway, the challenge to overcome all. That's the challenge, to, to overcome, you know, God will overcome all. The challenge to overcome all. Um, uh, and, and then you have um, this, this key transitional verse 
Revelation, well, let me run back real quick. Uh, the course of history is determined by God. That's good news. That is really good news. Um, uh, the sovereign God is in full command of human affairs as they move swiftly toward their end. Uh, in other words, and again, this is part of the powerful message, the course of history is not determined by politics, but by the power of God alone. The court, in other words, God is an active player in the, in our, in the movement of the world. Um, that is so different from the deist theology, which emerged, of course, in, you know, in, uh, in Europe and in uh, early American, uh, in some parts of early American Christian theology, where God is the unmoved mover. Uh, where God creates, creation is like a watch set up and it runs and then the watchmaker steps back. That is a, um, uh, that's one view, that has been one view. Uh, but Revelation really knocks that out of the park. It just doesn't going to have that. It says not only is God involved in the unfolding of history, God is intimately involved in the unfolding of history. Um, this is, why would this be such an important Message to those Christians in the first century. Why do you think that would be so important for them? Or the early second century? Having known what we read through the seven churches, why do you think that would be so important for them to hear that? Well, they were suffering persecution. And right. So the, the assurance that in spite of what they were seeing, they were not going to be squashed out of existence. Exactly. The church, this is, and, and, and it was the will. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why would it not be interpreted as predestination and it doesn't make any difference what we do? It's going to happen anyway. And that is another way it was looked at. That's another way it was looked at. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think the elements, you don't see a lot of elements of free will in Revelation. It is predestined. These things are meant to happen. In fact, Revelation, um, what Revelation is supposed to do is reveal, <laughs> reveal what God is going to do, what God is doing and what God's going to do. So it really is, you talk about predestination, the question is, well, what is predestined? Here is John saying, this is predestined. You're going to see. And what's cool is, if we look at it from a, a time point of view, the, the, the vision we, we're going to see in 4, 1 through 11 uh, of the throne seat in heaven, I mean, I mean, John is constantly shifting tenses in the Greek. He'll move from past imperfect to present to future all the time. And what he's trying to say is that this is going on right now. What you're seeing in the throne room is happening right now. Wherever you are in, it's timeless. But there are also elements of time. There is still past, present, future. So we're, that's, that's one of the hard hardest parts of interpretation of that. And then as I mentioned, chapters 4 and 5 are about assurance. The, the promise that um, uh, the assurance that and as you said, that everything will be okay. Everything's going to be alright. God has a plan. And that plan is unfolding. Okay? And, and you wonder sometimes as you look at I mean, sometimes when you think things should fall apart, they don't. Sometimes when you think we should have destroyed each other, we don't. Um, uh, uh, I think that's kind of miraculous in and of itself. And sometimes I, I feel that sense. Sometimes it feels kind of haphazard, but sometimes I feel that sense that God is really having a plan here, is unfolding things. Uh, one of the key verses that I've talked about is Revelation 3.21. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as myself, I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So this is spoken from Christ to believers. You will be with me on my throne, okay? Uh, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And we're going to talk about uh, enthronement uh, visions and throne seats. I did some of this in introduction last week. I just want to run by real, real quick, okay, just real quick. Uh, and, and then we'll get into the throne. Okay, now let's get into the throne visions, okay? Because I think we've done about enough of that as we can do. So let's, let's uh, sorry about that. Let's talk about the throne visions, all right? Um, uh, what is a throne vision? Um, well, Revelation 4.1 through Revelation 6.17, if you look at your outline, is set in the heavenly throne room. Uh, and as you see by this, uh, this is there's so many different wood carvings and depictions of the throne 
trying to be as accurate as they can. But a throne scene can happen at many levels in Old Testament apocalyptic and in New Testament writing as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and a lot of these, so, so this is kind of the pattern that we've been looking at when we talk about John. Just a reminder of the journey we're making with John. I'm not saying that John is necessarily the single writer of all this. You know, many scholars would argue that back and forth. But it kind of, I love this theory because it kind of makes sense. I, I guess I'm such a, I'm too much of a, a Cal, an orderly, decent and in order Calvinist not to like to see the order that we find in this. John, the Old Testament apocalyptic, who knows uh, Hebrew scripture, who knows Hebrew apocalyptic, becomes John the Christian, right? And the gospel writer. And so many, as we're going to see today, so many elements of John's gospel writing are in Revelation. That's what's interesting. I mean, it's hard to dispute that when there's unique language that only applies to Revelation and to John's Gospel and not anywhere else, which is really interesting. And then John, the Christian apocalyptic writer, the brilliance of taking Jewish apocalyptic and then instead of it being that, that kind of, 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 of just, you know, Jewish apocalyptic was just presented, this, as we talked about, this is going to happen, you can't do anything about it. Here comes John with the Christian apocalyptic, this is a hopeful message. This is a hopeful message. So it transforms that apocalypse. So I wanted us to trace that path because it's really important for us, okay? This path is very important for us to understand. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the throne vision. The throne vision report sometimes involving ascent. Now what do I mean by ascent when I say that throne vision reports sometimes involve ascent? What do you think that means? Rising up from earth. The which John does see John does that so there are many throne visions that we find in apocalyptic writing in, in scripture and outside of scripture as well some of them involve the seer for dip or somebody for different reasons ascending into the throne room of God okay frequently in both prophetic and apocalyptic literature and in early Judaism and in later rabbinical writing. These occur frequently, these throne vision reports. Um, so the focus of the throne vision always is God on the throne surrounded by angelic beings or lesser deities. We're going to talk a little bit about that, okay? So we'll be familiar with this when we see it. Angelic beings or lesser deities. There's always... And interestingly enough, John's view of the heavenly throne has concentric circles around it, which someone, some, some speculate that that's actually based upon the synagogue. Because the synagogue, the speaker would, would in the middle, be in the middle, then you would have the leaders of the synagogue, then you would have the males, and then way back here would be the females. And the Gentiles weren't even allowed in the room, so you forget that. So, uh, but there's all kinds of reasons, but, they, that, but John really uses these concentric circles. But here's like some of the, some of the uh, figures that we see, and this is generally true for all apocalyptic throne visions. There's angels, there's archangels. What's the difference between an angel and an archangel? Ark. What? What's that? Ark. Ark. Very good. Right. What? Right. Very good. Uh, we looked earlier, I'm not going to run back to the seven churches, but we saw the seven angels, the seven spirits for the seven angels of the churches. And, and in Jewish apocalyptic, they named them Michael, Gabriel, uh, uh, Uriel, Raguel, you know, there's all kinds. So uh, we named them all. So those are the archangels. Then there's seraphim. And, and seraphim, what are seraphim? What are seraphim? You ever thought, you've heard the word before. They're pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Good. Why are they scary? Why? The, the seraphim of the church, when we go to the synagogue, you know, they've got like seven eyes and four tongues. They're just in appearance. They're, they're and, they have, and they have a function. What are the function of the seraphim? Anybody would want to guess what they are. They are like the guards. They are like the, the, the knights. The knights of the court. The knights of the court. They have a, a function of, uh, 
of standing guard around the throne, basically. Uh, so, so they are like the ones that have the swords, or they're the ones that have, here's kind of a depiction of seraphim. They, they have a function, a, a specific function. And then the cherubim, the cherubim are associated directly with the Ark of the Covenant, as you see up here. You see the, the, the figures on the Ark? Those are cherubim. So again, they are part of that heavenly hierarchy, and they are their role is to praise. Their role is to praise, but they are always associated with the ark, always. And their role is to praise God. So you've got the angels who are the messengers. You've got the archangels who are the hierarchy and do God's will, uh, do do God's work. You've got the seraphim who are like the the standing guards, and then you've got the cherubim. And you will see that consistently. You will see this in throne room scenes in apocalyptic writing. They are always there. Uh, and all early uh, throne room scenes are based on the divine council and assemblies of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Phoenicia, and Israel. So they're based upon actual what a throne room looks like at that time. They're built around that vision. Uh, if you look at these three passages here, um, you will see images in the Old Testament of the throne rooms, okay? Uh, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 89, 6. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Jeremiah 23, 18. For who has stood in the council of the Lord as to see and hear his word? So, so we, we, you know, the, the, uh, God's throne room is imagined as an earthly council. It would look like an earthly throne room, a council. Now, who is seated always, if you think of an earthly throne room in the council, who's seated on the throne? Who? The monarch. That's easy. Who surrounds the monarch? Let's just use some earthly categories. Forget angels, archangels, angels, seraphim, and cherubim. Who just... We yeah, go ahead. Counselors. counselors, good. Counselors, excellent. Excellent. Counselors. The Who else? The cabinet. The cab. Very good. The cabinet. Exactly. Exactly. That that might even be kind of the role of the archangels in, in a, as a parallel. Who else surrounds a earthly throne in a throne room? Who's there? Military. But good. The the army, the guards, the lead. Absolutely. The military's there. Yeah. The knights. The knights are there. Who else? Lords and ladies in waiting. Well, yeah, good, very good. What do the lords and ladies do? Not much they, of anything. They wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> wait. Wait for a command. If you're getting they are in waiting. They're in waiting. Now, who? Let's think of some others that might be in that that throne room in Phoenicia or in Israel uh, in, in, or in uh, Mesopotamia or in or, or in Rome in the in the emperor's you know, uh, seat. Boys. Very good, very good. Uh, there are people seeking, seeking help or seeking favors. Okay, seeking favors. Uh, there are, uh, you said counselors. There are legal people there, people who have to do the, the the legal work, that have to seal the judgments, that have to present the things legally. So it, it's really you're going to see as we look at the throne, you're going to see every one of these figures in the throne doing these very functions. The difference is, the difference is there's an added element that you will not see in earthly throne rooms. Can anyone guess what it might be that, go, that everybody does in the heavenly throne room? And everybody does it. Worship. Worship, exactly. It is a worship scene. So that's where it breaks away. Because even, even in Rome, where the emperor, some emperors declared themselves as God, some didn't, many didn't. But, but where the emperors declared themselves as God, there was no worship in their throne room. The worship was at the temple or in other venues, okay? But not around, not around their throne, not around where they worked. That was not the case. Um, uh, it was more <laughs> political, it was more uh, process more than anything else. But this is the difference, and you're going to see that, okay? Uh, members of the heavenly assembly are called many different names in the, uh, 
uh, in the um, uh, in the in the old in the Hebrew tradition. Uh, and you'll see these are all from the old from the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, so the members of the heavenly assembly are, are are called gods in Exodus. They're called gods, which is interesting, isn't it? That that is not a, that's not a polytheism, by the way. That is a a sign of their status. They are, in other words, they're not they're not humans elevated. They're not saints. They are share power with God. They are, but they're called gods in Exodus 15, 11. They're called sons of God in the assembly in Psalm 29, 1. Sons of God. They're called sons of the Most High in Psalm 97, 7. They're called holy ones in Deuteronomy 33 and Zechariah 14, 5. And they're called sons of the gods in Job 1. 6 through 2, 1. So in all of these, they, they, there are different names associated and used with this heavenly assembly in traditional Jewish apocalyptic throne room scenes. Traditional Jewish apocalyptic throne room scenes. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so again, uh, just going to... Um, and then, and then uh, along with that, prophets are in there too. Now, what would be the role of prophets being seen in the throne room scene? Prophets who have ascended into the throne room. What is their role? What do they do? Foretell the future. Why are they there in the throne room scene? That's my question. You're right, but why are they there in the throne room? Why do we see prophets? Look at the, for who has stood in the counsel of the Lord so as to see and to hear his word? Who has given heed to his word so as to proclaim it? And in 1 Kings... Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing beside him to the right and to the left of him. So why would a prophet be there? Are they there to, to take the word out? Right. To, to take, you know, like they were. And, and we will see many of the prophets, not many, but some, like Isaiah, has a, interestingly enough, it can be a, it can be a scene that happens simultaneously on earth and heaven. They're in the throne room, but they're on earth. And they're receiving the word. Or they ascend like John into heaven and receive a vision or receive information to share. So, so it's mystical. It's mystical language. It's mystical language. Uh, or ecstatic religious language. But, but the prophets join the assembly. Um, um, uh, and like I said, sometimes the earthly throne room and the heavenly throne room uh, and, and the earthly temple, they merge. Sometimes that happens that they merge. And here's a perfect example of uh, the different types of throne room. This is a New Testament throne room scene, which we are all familiar with. And this one involves one of the you know different throne room scenes have different purposes. Uh, and we're going to talk about the purposes in just a minute. But here's one. That that uh, that that. Let's see what it highlights. Let's just read it, okay? When the Son of and you know this one. When the Son of Man, and this is Jesus speaking. I'll get this done. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. That's called a throne room scene, folks. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at the left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hopes. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. 
Then they all, they will also they will also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and were in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now this was spoken by Jesus. This is a throne room scene, a vision. Given by Christ. What is the purpose of the vision? What is the pur What are you seeing here in this vision? What's happening in the throne room? This is, this is judgment. This is so. While some throne room scenes are strictly for the glorification of God, this throne room scene by Jesus is to send a message of judgment. That judgment is going to come. And interestingly, what is judgment based upon here? How you treat your fellow. It sounds like works righteousness, doesn't it? I mean, it is a works judgment. And one of the things I love about this scene is that it broadens, it broadens um, uh, the idea of God's judgment beyond simple belief and into action. And, and you know, and it can apply to whom? Who can this apply to? Everyone. 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 This is actually a general view of judgment. You're not seeing saints here. They're not even called saints. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing just the world coming and being judged based upon what you did to me. What you did to me. It's an incredible scene. And it's amazing. And we really don't talk about it enough. It's a, it preaches really well, by the way. It preaches really, really well. I love to preach from this, but it's so long. <laughs> you, you spend half the sermon just reading it, you know. So, but it preaches really well, and um, it is one of those those throne scenes of judgment. And it's an amazing scene. It's an amazing scene, and it has an amazing message. Uh, so that's something that you know that we we we. I, I love using seeing this and being able to look at this and use it because it, it's it's it's. One we are familiar with, one we see, not realizing that we're seeing a, a meme, that we're seeing a thematic throne room scene here that Jesus is using. Um, also, we have um, um, other different types. Now, here here is an uh, Old Testament, I mean, a Hebrew scripture throne, a Jewish apocalyptic throne room scene of judgment. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. And his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed from his presence and thousands, thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I watched him because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death, and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So here is a throne room scene in Daniel, which very much informs John. John uses a lot of this language, okay? He applies it in a different way, but he uses a lot of this language, okay? So that's an example of judgment, okay? And there are quite a few purposes um, for these different throne room scenes. Um, let's talk about the types of enthronement. Okay, so now, what about the idea of enthronement scenes? Okay, there are throne scenes and enthronement. When an action is taken to put somebody on the throne. If you want to call it a coronation scene. But there are different reasons for it, okay? Uh, rewarded by God, we see that in Daniel 7, 13, 14. That's one of the reasons why someone can be enthroned. Judgment scenes, we saw that in Matthew. Commissioning scenes, Isaiah 6 shows a commissioning scene. The, 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 the action, and this can take place in heaven or it can take place on earth and heaven at the same time. Heavenly festal gatherings. Um, uh, these were uh, in heaven as you were gathering to do the Jewish festival it was happening in heaven as well so if you had the festival of the booths going on on earth they were doing the festival 
liturgy in heaven. Yeah, it was a, you know, it was like a, a, a mirror, a mirror, okay, a mirror. Uh, and then literary throne scenes. So, uh, let, let's take a look at a couple of these just for, um, here's Daniel 7, 13, 14. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. This is a messianic Jewish apocalyptic vision. And it is what, what is investiture? What does invest, that word mean? Investiture. A word Awarded, but it's a little bigger than awarded. It's when you receive the, the uh, certification or something of your office. You're invested. You're invested. What, 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 I, what it focuses on is status. Your status changes. When you are invested to her, you become that which you are invested to be. It's not a commission, because a commission is a tax. That's, that's task oriented. This is an investiture scene. Now, why is that important? Because most of the commentaries agree that in John, when we look at the throne room scene in, in chapter 4, it is an investiture of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. So, the language used here of the one like a human being, that language John grabs directly onto and associates it with the Lamb of God. Interestingly enough, John the Gospel, and John and Revelation are the only ones that use the image of Christ as a lamb. That's a unique John image. So here again is that relationship between John the Gospel writer and John the Apocalypse. Because the, he's the only one that does that. He's the one that associates the lamb direct. In fact, I don't know if you get this or not, but the reason the time of Jesus' crucifixion is different in John than from Matthew, Mark, and Luke is because he puts Christ's crucifixion directly on the, pass the day of Passover. The day of Passover, when the lamb is slaughtered. He makes that direct association. And he, John isn't chronological. He doesn't care about chronology. He cares more about meaning than chronology. So he has that gospel just full of those kind of symbolic meanings. Okay? Um, and that's interesting in and of itself. So here's Daniel 7. Here is, um, um, let, me, let me jump out here real quick. Here, that's the judgment scene. Uh, I think this, yeah, this is the commission scene. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet. Like the ark. There's a chair being, but like the ark, they cover their faces. So it's actually illustrated in the ark. Holy, holy. And then one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy. There's that three, three thing liturgy. Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We'll talk about that. Now. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. We got a hymn. Here I am, Lord. It is based upon this passage. And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. This is a combination of commissioning and judgment against Israel. Because Isaiah is going to declare judgment for their apostasy. So this is a, so here is Isaiah being commissioned for a particular task. And, and the task is not to be clear with the people. 
to make them guess at what God's intentions are. It's really interesting. Um, um, uh, so here's that predestination aspect. You know, here's that predestination aspect. Um, but of course, Isaiah, what's Isaiah really speaking about here? At this end, what's he speaking about? He's talking about the current situation in Israel as he writes. They're not listening. They're not looking. They're not seeing. They're not comprehending, see? So what he's taking is the current situation, and he's saying this is God's will. See what I mean? That's apocalyptic. This has meaning and purpose that they're not listening. Something's going to happen, right? Something's on its way. Because, and so there is meaning and purpose to their apostasy. There's meaning and purpose to their lack of belief. And that's just classical apocalyptic theology. Okay? Any thoughts or questions about that? Is that understood? Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? He has the vision, but down here is the real time. So this is kind of an earth-heaven thing going on here. But this is the actual situation that he's dealing with. And he announces, I'm commissioned to tell you that you, you know, this is what you're doing, and this is God intends you to do this. So, because you need to be judged. You need to get back. Here's the uh, heavenly festal gathering in Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Mount Zion is always the image of the heavenly throne room, the heavenly Jerusalem, and, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous. Now here we see the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That's, this is now New Testament apocalyptic in Hebrews. Uh, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood. I'm sorry. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So uh, this is a kind of a festal scene, a festal gathering uh, to one of the, the traditional uh, Jewish festivities, but placed into a Christian context. Placed into a Christian context. Jewish mysticism, I didn't put any examples of that because really that's nowhere to be found in Hebrew Scripture. It's outside Hebrew Scripture. And it's just like we're rabbis being taken up into to see the third heaven or the fourth heaven. In, in Jewish apocalyptic, and this is kind of important, in Jewish apocalyptic, there are seven, at least seven heavens. At least seven heavens, if not more. Uh, Paul talks about being taken up to the seventh heaven. In, in, in I think it's Corinthians. We'll probably see that verse later. John only sees one heaven. He unites that in his vision. He doesn't talk about, so he takes, he moves from the Jewish apocalyptic view of, set, of levels of heaven, seven heaven, to the, the seven heavens, if not more, I think there's 12 total, to the one heaven. Okay? And the investiture of Christ. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And here's the uh, literary throne scenes, which really, they just tend to move the, they're moving the narrative forward. That's why they're literary. Because your heart was penitent, you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring on this place. And that's kind of an iffy throne scene, but it is stays on earth. It is a more of an earthly scene. So, uh, any, so that stops with the throne scene. We finally stopped with the throne scene. But now you see what you're going to be seeing as we get to, to chapter 4 and the different forms of it and how they're used and how John uses it differently in Revelation than what has traditionally been used in Jewish apocalyptic. Okay? Uh, and in our case, when we see, when we, like I told you before, when we see it in chapter 4 and 5, it is an investiture scene. It is, a, it is a recognition of the status. Look at, look at the window. What's Jesus holding? The lamb. The lamb. The lamb. Yeah. yeah. The good shepherd. So that's uh, really important. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the heavenly ascent motif of going from earth to heaven or staying on earth and seeing heaven, going in the spirit, 
in the old in Old Testament or New Hebrew apocalyptic, sometimes they would go bodily into their vision. They'd actually go physically into their vision. Uh, the heavenly ascent motif, we could just divide basically into five groups, okay? Uh, first, the rabbinic sources. The rabbi said, um, you know, I, I was taken into heaven and I saw this. Or my spirit was taken into heaven and my spirit saw this, which is kind of the ecstatic vision, which is what John basically says. Uh, so we're going to talk about that as we get there. Then there are first person accounts of famous biblical figures who go into heaven. Now, these are not in our canon, in our Old Testament canon. But they are in Jewish apocalyptic writings. So Abraham goes to heaven. Moses goes to heaven. And sees a scene. Right? Is there this type of ascension scene in the New Testament? Beyond John. Beyond uh, Revelation. Where do you see it in, elsewhere in the New Testament? Jesus ascends into heaven. What do you see, where do you see that? Well, not just the ascension of Jesus. I'm talking about... Where where a scene is opened up because you see Jesus ascending, but you don't see afterwards what happened. Where where do you see it in the New Testament? The transfiguration, the transfiguration is an ascension scene because Jesus. It, who's with Jesus when he in the transfiguration? Moses and Elijah, and 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 the you know and the. Uh, Peter, James, and John see this. They, are, they see this opening. So here's an earthly ascension scene where you remain on earth, but you actually look and see it. So that's an ascension scene right there uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the New Testament. Uh, there were, there's a, a, a type of literature in Jewish apocalyptic called the Hecalot. <laughs> ah, Hecalot, right. Palaces. Hecalot means palaces. So there's these scenes of these heavenly palaces. Uh, I'm not going to get into them, but they were modeled on the Persian type palaces uh, and Eastern type palaces. They're just, and then there's a, ecstatic mysticism. And Revelation has a bit of ecstatic mysticism with it. Um, but when we talk about ecstatic mysticism, we're talking about magic, the use of magic. So, so a magician will ascend into um, uh, into into heaven. And, and, and bring back, you know, it, you talk about healing, you talk about all kinds of different things. So, so magic, mysticism, was running at the same time Christianity and John was doing it. And they were, you know, and, and so sometimes John writes to counter this mysticism, to ground it, yeah. Isn't it true that the ecstatic mysticism you do something to create the ecstatic state. Yes. That, that yeah. Yeah. Other than yeah. God reaching down going. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. And and that that differs from the way John writes Revelation. The way he sees it, it's not a he doesn't put himself into that state. He is brought in to that state. Very good point. Where in eclectic mysticism, you may fast, uh, you may 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 go into deep meditation. You may do. You may even do rituals that take you there. Okay, and this is where it gets a little chancy because it starts spilling over into magic rather than faith or rather than belief. Um, and there are all you know all during the time of John, there are quote unquote spells, Christian spells. There's a whole segment of the church that's involved in mysticism, and we talked about it at the seven churches, right? The uh, Nicolaitans, possibly. The, the Phrygian heresy. That was all this mystical, charismatic spirituals. You hear about the whirling dervishes. Yeah, dance. there you go. Ecstatic dancing. Yes, ecstatic dancing. To put you into a state of, 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 of where, you're, where you become into a different state. And, where, you know, so, uh, and that is not the case with John. John is taken up. Uh, it is open to him. Okay. And, what yeah. about Paul and his conversion experience? Very good, yeah. Later trips up into the desert. And Paul uses a lot of mystic, mystic language. He does. It's very good you point that out. His experience at the road to Damascus has that sound of a mystic vision. You know what I mean? 
It's got that sound of uh, the light coming and then the voice. But Paul never describes that scene, what he sees. He describes what he hears, a voice. But he doesn't, all he says is he sees a light and then he's blinded, stricken blind. But he does talk about being taken. It's interesting because when Paul talks about being taken up to the seventh heaven, he's not speaking about being a Christian. He's talking about being a righteous Jew. That he was, that he, in other words, he was, he experienced Jewish mysticism and, was to, and had a Jewish mystic apocalyptic vision, which is very interesting. Uh, Paul and John, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. This is, this is what we're talking about. It is necessary to boast. This is Paul. Nothing is to be gained by it. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told. That no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Already he's revealed he's talking about himself. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was giving me, giving me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. And that Greek word, elated, can also be translated as that same mystic understanding of ecstasy, too ecstatic, too ecstatic, okay, too ecstatic. Uh, uh, so uh, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. What was going on in the church of Corinth? What was going on in the church of Corinth? Does anyone remember? Why was Paul writing to Corinth? There were teachers that had come into that church. And they were teaching a different type of Christianity, a mystic one. And it was very attractive to some of the members of that church. It was dividing the church. So here is Paul saying, well, I know what it is to have a mystic experience. And it's interesting, he says 14 years ago, he never mentions Christ, seeing Christ, or seeing anything. He, and if you take this to be him, because really, Paul separated who he was pre Christianity and post Christianity. He was Saul, totally different person than he was Paul. Okay? And he really did make that separation. So if this is Saul 14 years ago, he had a Jewish mystic experience, probably a fasting experience or some type of disciplinary type, because that's what they would do. Now he says, I don't do that anymore. I have been given a thorn in the flesh that I can't do that, which is interesting. I wonder what the thorn in the flesh is that would prevent him from having an ecstatic experience. And it may be that ecstatic experiences, even in the early Christian church, were brought on by physical things that you did. Whether it was dancing, whatever it was. So that Paul couldn't do that. Paul couldn't do that. So maybe that's what it's talking about. Who knows? Who knows? But Paul is pointing out that you don't really, to the Corinthians, you don't really need these mystical experiences. That, that my, you know, my power is my weakness. Because what, you know, this happens not only in the early churches, it still happens in churches today. A group of spirit, it's Gnosticism. We've talked about Gnosticism. A group of spiritually centered believers, quote unquote, spiritually centered, declares that they have secret knowledge. And that in order for you to have this secret knowledge, you need to do what they are doing. 
whether it's speaking in tongues, whether it's doing ecstatic, whatever it is. And Paul, as you know, wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongue of humans and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a, or a clanging cymbal, which is a purely anti-ecstatic experience statement. Okay? Okay? So, so uh, in other words, what good is it for you to do, Corinthians, for you to do all these mystical things and have these charismatic experiences if you don't love each other? Because the church is being torn apart by this. Okay? Does that make sense? So here he is saying, I had an experience. I had an experience, but, you know, that is not the primary meaning of being a Christian. That even in weak, that your weakness is your power in being a Christian. Your testimony, your, 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 your you know, Christianity is based upon surrender. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace, that's all you need. Listen to that again. My grace is sufficient. You don't need mystical experiences. You don't need da 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 If we're talking about salvation, my grace is enough. Okay? Does that make sense? So, this is where we're talking about, again, these, uh, these ascension scenes. We're, you know, we've been talking about these ascension scenes. It would seem to me that most, if we think worldwide, most Christians today think those experiences are real. Many do. Many do. Many do. And Paul never minded that. Paul, but he said, if it becomes divisive and hostile, if it divides the body of Christ, it's a problem. It's a problem. I mean, all Christian. I mean, uh, Christianity always has an element, mystic element to it, or spirit. Let's call it a spiritual element rather than a mystic element. I mean, we talk about you know communion. What is communion? It is where heaven and earth meet at the table. It's a place where you enter the, room, the heavenly space with God. The Spirit brings you there. So you're supposed to have an encounter with the Spirit uh, at communion. There's supposed to be some kind of encounter at communion. Uh, that's the way it's understood in, in almost every Christian tradition. Music. Music. Well, music. Music. A good point. That's what. Yes, yes, and its music is powerful. Churches fight over music. Of course, they fight over everything. But but music can be a particular fighting point in a church, or it can be a source of great inspiration. So, we're, what is inspiration? The incoming of the Spirit. Inspired. It is the incoming of the Spirit. So so yes, let's not push away spiritual experience but what Paul is saying is the spiritual experience will not save you it's got nothing to do with salvation my grace is sufficient for you okay so when it doesn't matter whether you speak in tongues or whether you have a spiritual experience it doesn't matter if that happens or not if you believe if you believe that then the grace of Christ is sufficient so see so um, um, that, that's kind of, that's what he's trying to deal with. Because again, some of the leaders in the Corinthian church are demanding that, that the others do these things. They're demanding that they do these things. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we're okay. Uh, so, six scenes in Revelation. There are six scenes in Revelation itself that center on the heavenly throne room. Because we're about to get now to the actual text. We won't be coming back to this. This is just introductory material. Here's 7, Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The Lamb has already been invested, which we're going to see in chapters 4 and 5. Robed in white with palm branches in their hands, highly liturgical. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne. Because you never sit when the king is on, or the monarch is on the throne. You don't sit unless you're invited to do so. Uh, that's that, earth, you know, that earthly vision throne room. 
and, uh, stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these white? Who are these? Uh, white robed and white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, persecuted with the martyrs. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These throne scenes are really cool. They're really amazing scenes. Here's, here's the, uh, the next one. Uh, Revelation 11. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. He will reign forever and ever. Then the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come, and the time for judging the dead, for, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, earthquake, and heavy hail. Where God is, you have theophany, signs of the theophany, from Mount Sinai. That's, that's where it's borrowed from. And we've got one more scene to look at. Uh, this is Revelation 14, 1 through 5. This is the last one. Now this, these are the throne room scenes that we will see. Then I looked and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And remember that 444,000 is a mathematical formula. That's a mathematical formula. Uh, and I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one can learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been redeemed from humankind as first fruits for God in the Lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found. They are blameless. We'll get to that. When we get to 14. So that's the last. So we see these like uh, throughout. We see the first one that we're going to look at. Then we see these others uh, as we go through Revelation. Um, finally, before we move forward, there is one type of mysticism whose images we will see reflected by John. And it's called chariot mysticism. What do I mean by chariot mysticism? Are you, where do you see chariots? Mysticism happened in the Old Testament. Red Sea. What's that? The opening of the Red Sea. Over in the Red Sea, and then where else? But where do you see it as a mystic experience? Uh, is it Ezekiel who's taken up in a chariot. Ezekiel, and then who else? There's another prophet, uh, Elijah. Elijah. Taken Elijah. up to heaven yeah. in a chariot. Okay, so that's chariot mysticism. And here's Ezekiel one four through twenty one, which is a perfect example. And we will see these images reflected. In Revelation, which is why I'm doing it. Okay. Well, I'm sure this with you. I have an appointment. That's fine. I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. fine. And you can pick up the rest of it. We're going to finish up here in just a minute. But you can pick up the rest of it on, uh, on, on, the, on the tape. And I looked. A stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it, and this fire flashing forth continually. And in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. There, there, this was their appearance. They were of human form. Each had four faces and each had four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Remember we saw these images in the opening vision, the inaugural vision, right? In chapter one, right? 
We looked at some of the, like the bronze, the image of the bronze. Under the wings of their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each of them moved straight ahead without turning as they moved. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Each moved straight ahead. Whenever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. In the middle of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and lightning issued from the fire. The living creatures darted to and fro like a flash of lightning. This is a chariot scene from Ezekiel. And this is the, the motif of chariot mysticism, which the only reason I bring it to you is because we are going to see it, and this is the, the I'm not going to read all the rest of it, but look. And I looked at the living creature, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their destruction, their appearance was like the gleaming of barrel. And the four had the same form of construction, being something like a wheel within a wheel. Chariot imagery. Yeah? I see the reference to a wheel in that one, but I didn't see a wheel in the previous one. Well, these are, this is the same passage. I just, oh. that's the second page of the same oh, passage. Oh, oh. So it brings you to the wheel. Here's the chariot. Oh, okay. Here's the chariot. I didn't finish reading all that. It's a long passage, but there it is. There it is, okay? So we will see, we won't see wheels per se, but what we will see are similar images of the chariot business. Chariot be associated with status or power or transport. Literally transport. Could be a simple chariot. Exactly. Exactly. Simple transport. Simple moving from one place to the other. That's the chariot imagery. So I tell you, okay, now. Uh, now we're going to actually move to, I think we're gonna stop here and we'll pick up uh, next week. Uh, next week we will have our class. The following week is Holy Week. We will not be having our class. Okay? Monday, Thursday. That would be Monday, Thursday. Then the following week, we'll pick right back up. Okay? So next week, we meet. The following week, we don't. Okay? Uh, but then we are going to move to God is worshipped for creation. So we're actually going to go into the text. But I wanted you to see these themes and these motifs because we're going to be seeing them. And it gives us some understanding of where they come from. They don't just arise out of John's imagination. They come from various sources. And what you're going to learn when we go through this is there are also some cultural sources, we talked about that before, that they come from. Roman, Greco-Roman, uh, uh, Asia, Asia Minor sources. You know. So, so, so again, I, I, the more I study this, the more I realize John is really speaking to his culture at the time, the Christians who are living in this culture. Using, that's why we have to pick the language apart to figure out why is he saying it this way, okay? So we'll stop there, uh, and uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll see this, the shift of the, we'll see the central focus of the vision now shift to heaven, keyed by the phrase, after this, after this I looked, and there's the one through 11, okay? And we'll look at all these images and how we parse them uh, and we'll finish that up. Then we'll, 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 then chapter five is the investiture of the lamb. And that's when the lamb steps forth uh, and, is, it, and is recognized by God as the son of God, as the lamb, and as the one by which the world is saved. Okay. Any questions? All right. We did a pretty good job of avoiding politics today, didn't we, Jim? Uh, I, I like that. So I no, no, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing you, but we did. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be on our own. Lord, we thank you for the time we've shared. Blessed be with us. And as we go to share a meal, Lord, let it bless us with strength and encouragement. Help us, Lord, to continue as scholars and as theologians and as believers, Lord, coming to learn about your word and about what that means to us and how we are to apply that word to our lives. 
Thank you, Lord, for the peace that passeth understanding as we come, knowing, Lord, that you do have the whole world in your hands. And that's the one of the messages that we receive from John. In your holy name, we pray.